As Doctor Who reached its 25th season, a 25th anniversary story was bound to happen. This would become Silver Nemesis, but a story that is recognised more as a celebration of Doctor Who's 25 year history is the opener to the season, Remembrance of the Daleks. With allegories of racial purity and civil war, not only was the story bound to be a good one, but a welcome refresh for the series. So let's take a look back at Ace's first real story as companion, and one which is regarded as one of the best Doctor Who stories of all time. The story opens with a nice pre-title sequence with the camera starting on Earth and then panning back to reveal a great looking spaceship model. Then the explosive intro to the title sequence makes a nice cut off of the sequence, paving the way into darker and more mysterious stories influenced by the Cartmel master plan, but more on that later. Then straight after the title sequence, which I think is great by the way, we see the sign of Coal Hill School, the school scene in the first ever episode of Doctor Who. This is the first callback of the story, and believe me, it won't be the last. I really enjoy this opening. The pace slowly builds up, leading to the brilliant scene in Totter's Yard, where our threat is revealed to the audience, the Daleks. This is not only another callback to the first episode, but also to the season 22 story, Attack of the Cybermen, with the Doctor kneeling down by the soldier and saying, His insides were scrambled. The show's new direction was starting to become apparent. This whole scene is brilliant actually, from the dramatic Dalek deaths to Sylvester McCoy's hilarious line of Peace! Give me some of that Nitro 9 that you're not carrying! It's just a brilliant scene. The pace is somewhat frenetic, but it doesn't feel too fast. There are so many threads that are set up during these first few scenes, and one of my favourites is the girl. There's something obviously off about her from the first scene, and the moment where she says It's a doctor at the gate is truly chilling. But back to the Nitro 9, and more importantly, the explosions and pyrotechnic work in this story. This story is famous for them, and they really don't disappoint. There are so many moments in this story where something blows up and it just feels right, not too much, unlike Danny Hargreaves seems to think. I've always thought this story to be a great introduction to the show, or even just the classic series. This is typified in the great van scene, where we're told exactly what a Dalek is, and it also hints to the rest of the plot. With their journey back to the school, we meet the headmaster, played by Michael Sheard. Sheard was a somewhat regular of the classic show, with this being his sixth appearance. This was the final time he appeared in the series. We later discover he's in league with the Daleks. After the Doctor and Ace take a trip around the school, they creep down into the cellar where they discover a transmat device. The Doctor temporarily deactivates it, but then it hits him. So no more Daleks can be transported through here? Well, it'll slow them down a bit until the operator can repair the systems. The operator? Yes, the Daleks usually leave an operator on station in case of any malfunctions. And that would be another Dalek? Yes. Stay where you are! But then, terrifyingly, the Doctor stands helpless at the door, as, for the first time, the Dalek which comes after them flies up the stairs. I adore the design of both Dalek factions, not only the cast scheme, but the completely new designs, and also the use of the plunger attachments. Speaking of Dalek factions, the renegade Dalek faction's ally is Mr. Ratcliffe, and his fascist group, the Association. In their base, they have a Dalek battle computer. Its design is obviously reminiscent of Davros and is somewhat set up for the audience to think that it is him. John Leeson, the voice of the computer, rewatched previous Davros episodes to recreate the voice. But as we'll discover later, this wouldn't be Davros, but a very surprising character. The Doctor and Ace take an ATR from a nearby van in order to destroy the transmat, but before they could get there, the Dalek from before comes out to surprise them and Ace destroys it with the rocket launcher. Ace. You destroyed it. I aim for the eyepiece. The Doctor then leaves and this leads to the brilliantly directed cafe scene. Ah, a decision. Would it make any difference? Would make your tea sweet? Yes, but beyond the confines of my taste buds, would it make any difference? Not really. But... Yeah? What if I could control people's taste buds? What if I decided that no one would take sugar? That would make a difference to those who sell the sugar and those who cut the cane. My father, he was a cane cutter. Exactly. 
Now, if no one had used sugar, your father wouldn't have been a cane cutter. If this sugar thing had never started, my great-grandfather wouldn't have been kidnapped, chained up, and sold in Kingston in the first place. I'd be an African. See? Every great decision creates ripples. Like a huge boulder dropped in a lake. The ripples merge, rebound off the banks in unforeseeable ways. The heavier the decision, the larger the waves, the more uncertain the consequences. Life's like that. Best thing is just to get on with it. A nice quiet moment for a loud story. The Doctor then goes to a funeral parlour where he goes to collect the Hand of Omega. Also here we have a reference to the first Doctor, William Hartnell himself. Oh, Governor, hey, somebody's come to collect that big casket. Yes, yes, the Doctor. It's just one thing, Governor. I thought you said he was an old geezer with white hair. The Doctor then tells the casket to follow him and it floats up and does so. The effects here really aren't bad at all. This then leads to the graveyard scene where the Doctor talks to the Vicar while the casket floats into the hole. The Vicar is played by Peter Halliday who played the character back up. in The Invasion back in 1968. He had returned many times since then but that's what I remembered him as. Then we see Mike receiving a call from Ratcliffe, and then the fight between him and the headmaster is really great. Oh, what is the location of the renegade Dalek base? What? Get off me, or I'll break What is the location of the renegade Dalek base? I don't know what you're talking about. Renegade Daleks have defied the will of the Emperor Dalek. They must be located and destroyed. And you are an agent of the Renegade Daleks. I work for Mr. Ratcliffe, the Association. <laughs> Who do you work for? No. Who do you work for? Back at the school, Ace comes along to beat up a Dalek with her baseball bat. This is such an iconic moment in the story. Small human female sighted on level three. What are you calling small? Under a tree, under a tree. There's an impaired. Reinforcements requested. This leads to the brilliant cliffhanger of Ace being surrounded by the Daleks. But let's rewind for a second and go to a very famous moment in this story, the Doctor Who meta reference. This is fascinating and really makes this story feel like a celebration. This is BBC television. The time is a quarter past five and Saturday viewing continues with an adventure in the new science fiction series, Doctor Who. So back to the start of part 3 now, where the Doctor activates his device, which stuns the Daleks. I really like his line of... It's almost childlike, I love it. Then we see a callback to the first Dalek story, where the Doctor inspects one of the Daleks and a corn-like creature strangles him. This was first hinted at at the end of part 3 of the Daleks, where under a blanket a claw reveals itself. There are so many nice character moments in this story, too many to mention. This is one of those stories that really needs to be seen to be believed. Speaking of character moments, I adore the staircase scene, which sets up the Cartmel master plan and the rest of the plot beautifully. A long time ago, on my home planet of Gallifrey, there lived a stellar engineer called Omega. Stella? As in stars? You mean he engineered stars? Ace! Oh, sorry. Go on. It was Omega who created the supernova that was the initial power source for Gallifreyan time travel experiments. He left behind him the basis on which Rassilon founded Time Lord Society. And he left behind the hand of Omega. His hand? What good was that? No, no, not his hand, literally. No, no, it's called that because Time Lords have an infinite capacity for pretension. Mm, I've noticed that. The hand of Omega is a mythical name for Omega's remote stellar manipulator. A device used to customise stars with. <laughs> and didn't we have trouble with the prototype? We? They. And the Daleks want it so they can recreate the time travel experiments? But you said that both Dalek factions can already travel in time. Oh yes, Daleks have got time corridor technology, but it's very crude and nasty. And what they want is the power that time lords have. And they'll get that with the hand of Omega. Or so they think. And you have to try and stop them. 
No ways I want them to have it. Eh? My problem is trying to stop Group Captain Gilmore and his men getting diced in the crossfire. So, all this is... Is a massive deception, yes. Around this part of the story, we see the new Emperor Dalek design. The Emperor had last been seen in The Evil of the Daleks back in 1967, but as we'll discover soon, it may not actually be the Emperor. Soon, Ratcliffe and his men dig up the Hand of Omega and takes it back to his warehouse where we discover that the Dalek battle computer is in fact the creepy girl from earlier. This is a brilliant twist, and I remember the first time I watched it, I was genuinely surprised. The Doctor and Ace then sneak into Ratcliffe's yard to take a look around. Here, the Doctor temporarily deactivates the Dalek's time controller and places his calling card atop it. Let's fast forward towards the end of the episode, where back at the school, suddenly the Imperial Dalek's shuttlecraft lands in the middle of the playground. It is so impressive and was done for real, not with a model. It's a great end to the episode, and I love McCoy's I think I might have miscalculated. which makes it almost funny. Now we reach the final part and the climax of the story, with the Imperial Daleks rolling out of their shuttlecraft and going to attack the Renegade Daleks, the Civil War begins. The Imperials deploy their special weapon, the Special Weapons Dalek. It's such a brilliant design and I love the massive turret it has. With the Imperials then coming to claim the Hand of Omega and taking it back to their ship, we discover who the Emperor really is. Davros, I should have known. I see you've discarded the last vestige of your human form. There's still no improvement. Save your insults for the weak-minded doctor. Will you return the Hand of Omega or not? Are you threatening me? If so, it is most unwise. Every time our paths have crossed, I have defeated you. <laughs> Yes, it's a pity that Davros isn't in more of the story, but the time he is in the story, he is really well played by Terry Malloy. The Imperial Daleks then deploy the Hand, which then turns Scaro's son, Supernova, before destroying the mothership. Did Davros escape? Well, that's left up in the air. Back over in Mike's house, the girl comes in and kills Mike before essentially dying herself, because the Doctor convinces the Black Dalek, which is her, that it has no purpose because the rest of its race is dead. The story ends with Mike's funeral and the Doctor and Ace questioning whether they did good in the end. We did good, didn't we? Perhaps. Time will tell. Almost does. <laughs>